Good evening. Happy Friday Eve. That's what I like to call Thursdays, okay? <laughs> Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's conversation, Beyond the Thesis, Nonfiction Publishing for Scholars. My name is Melissa Mayard. I use pronouns she, her, hers, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Associate Director for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in University Life. Before we get started, I would like to take this time to do a land acknowledgement created by the Columbia University School of Nursing. We acknowledge the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Lenape people on which we learn, work, and gather today at Columbia University. Lenape means real person or original person. And it is important to remember that Lenape collectively are a living and breathing community. Let us honor their legacy. Let us commit ourselves to the struggle against forces that have dispossessed the Lenape and other indigenous people of their lands. We stand strong in our commitment to support and defend all marginalized people of this land who have been stripped of their rights to self-determination. Thank you to Columbia's nursing school who actually issued this acknowledgement. And this upcoming Monday, October 11th, also marks the second anniversary of the University of University Senate's resolution to recognize Indigenous Peoples Day at Columbia as a result of student advocacy. Indigenous Peoples Day is celebrated on the second Monday of October to honor the cultures and history of the Native American Indigenous people. Whether you are seeking ways to actively promote racial justice as an ally, or you identify as Native or Indigenous and seek resources, we invite, we invite you to visit Resources for Combating Anti-Native and Indigenous Racism on the University Life website. We also encourage you to find out more about local Indigenous territories and languages which you are sitting on in this moment. We are adding both resources to the chat now for you to learn more about resources available to you in Columbia and in the broader community. Again, thank you for joining us today. This event is actually part of University Life's Graduate Initiative for Inclusion and Engagement, which promotes Columbia's commitment to diversity and the success of all graduate and professional school students and is co-sponsored by the Center for Nonfiction and the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. Before I turn it over to our esteemed panelist and moderator, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, this program will be recorded and shared via University Life's YouTube channel. If you have any questions about this recording, please feel free to contact our office. Also, please make sure to remain muted. Towards the end of the roundtable, there will be an opportunity for questions, and we ask that you type your questions into the chat box so that we can answer as many as possible. We also recommend that you keep your view on speaker view versus gallery view. Now I would like to introduce our guests. Please note, these are shortened and abbreviated bios. Each of our panelists have achieved tremendous accomplishments. And I encourage you to look into them in more depth after today's event. And I just have to tell you, just listening and engaging with these panelists prior to the start of this program, I am so excited for this conversation. I know it's gonna be amazing. First is Rico Davis, agent at Di Fiori and Associates. Before joining Di Fiori in uh, early 2016, Rika was an associate agent at Miriam Alshuler Literary Agency. She grew up in Kansas City, received her bachelor's in comparative literature and art history from Brown University, and is a graduate of the Columbia Publishing course. Rika's interests are varied, but she is particularly drawn to, the, to narrative journalism on the topics of pop culture, science slash psychology, and current events, as well as memoir that focuses on social justice, issues of race and gender, and the history and experiences of women and people of color. Next is Yadin Israel, senior editor at Simon & Schuster and creator of the Literary Swag Book Community, a cultural mu movement that intersects literature and fashion to make books accessible. He has written for Avidly, uh, The New Inquiry, Lit Hub, Poets and Writers, and Vanity Fair. He teaches creative writing at City College and hosts a Literary Swag Book Club, a Brooklyn-based subscription service and book club that meets every last Wednesday of the month. Our next panelist is Rachel Canberry, assistant editor at 12. Rachel is a writer, novelist, and editor specializing in war and military literature and history. Born and raised in Oregon, Rachel self-published her first World War II novel, 
gravel in 2009, two months before she graduated from high school. She earned a bachelor's in literature from Eugene Lang College in 2013 and studied war history at the American University of Paris. Rachel's work has appeared in The Wrath Bearing Tree, Consequence Magazine, The Quivering Pen, The United States World War Centennial Commission, and The Columbia Journal. Our final, uh, but certainly not least, panelist, uh, Pronoy Sarkar, Senior Editor at Little Brown and Company. Pronoy acquires bold, ambitious, and conversation-shifting projects across a range of areas. Pronoy is also interested in cultural tastemakers, crit critics, and influencers with fresh perspectives and points of view. Previously, he was an editor at St. Martin's Press, and before that, they worked at Picador, U.S., and Simon & Schuster. Some other authors uh, Pronoy has worked with include Dean Irwin uh, Sherminsky, economist Linda Yui, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing names, <laughs> diplomat Philip Gordon, Eric Posner, Michael D'Antonio, Barry Lynn, Edmund Richardson, playwright Andre Gregory, and the Wu-Tang Clan. <laughs> like, Y'all are so amazing. Okay. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Kevin O'Connor. Kevin is the principal at O'Connor Literary Agency and founding director of the Center for Nonfiction. A graduate of Columbia College, Kevin has experience in every aspect of kids' media and was named an Alea Bundles Community Scholar by Columbia University for 2019 to 2022. Since his first job out of college at Sesame Workshop, Kevin has always worked at the intersection of business and creative. He has hands-on experience in a variety of media, including animation, live action, TV, toys, live shows, and more. In addition to Sesame, he's worked for Fisher Price, VTech, Kids Bop, Barnes and Noble, and Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. He's inked deals with Chrysler, Nestle, Pearson, and all the major publishers. These are our incredible panelists for today's event. And with that, I will stop talking and I would love for you to join me in welcoming them as I turn it over to our amazing moderator, Kevin. Kevin? Awesome. Thank you so much, Melissa. And thank you for having us. I'm a very proud Columbia guy tonight. So thank you. Um, this, uh, this whole project started out with a conversation with another Columbia grad, uh, John Glusman, who is editor in chief at Norton and thought about different ways that he could give back to uh, the Columbia community, which is so naturally connected to publishing, uh, not only because of the smart work that you uh, that all Columbia people do, but also just the location. And so, um, and so I started the Center for Nonfiction um, and we've been going um, with, with the Bundles Scholarship uh, for two or three years now. Um, it is my supposition that in this audience tonight that there is a Jill Lepore, that there is a Simon Shama, and that there is a Jalan Cobb, and it is our job, the job of, of uh, Reiko, Pernoy, Yadon, uh, Rachel, and myself to find you and to give you the tools that you need to be really, really incredibly awesome and to build your career over time. Um, and that is really what um, we're all about, is trying to give you some tools to understand and not be frightened about publishing, to get you right in and um, thinking about things, not just about one book, but as Pernoy uh, said to me many times, to think about building a career over time um, and always going with a bigger book and a bigger book and a bigger book, uh, reaching more and more people. Um, so um, I want to thank everyone for sending the pre-selected questions, the questions beforehand. That actually really helped me, and it made me actually change the entire uh, panel tonight, just beforehand. And we're going to talk about three main areas um, that all the questions coalesced around and the things that I think we really want to talk about, which is the content. What should you be writing? What's a proposal? What's the difference between academic and trade publishing or general readership? How does the business work? How do you get an agent? What does an agent do? What, what, how much should you get paid? What are royalties? What are foreign rights, et cetera, et cetera? And then um, the marketing side. And I'm really excited to have you, Don, here, um, who's created literary swag. And that's, you know, publishing isn't always known for being the most entrepreneurial um, or with it thing, but uh, Yadon has been right there talking about how books need communities uh, to really grow and build. And, um, and so I'm really excited for the conversation. Um, so the first area that I really wanna dive into is what's the difference between trade or general readership um, publishing and academic publishing? And Pranoy and I were speaking just before the, the, uh, the panel began a little bit about the scholarly um, panels that he goes to where he sees a range 
of, um, of scholars at different parts of their career. And, um, and he's actually taken on a few of them um, to maybe go on a different route that they would have normally um, gone on. And so Pranoy, I'll kind of kick it off to you. Like, what is it that you do? How do you find scholars? Where, what's your vision for them? Thank you, Kevin. Um, thank you, Melissa. This is a, a privilege to be here and to be among these esteemed colleague, uh, members of the publishing industry, many of whom I, I've known about, actually one of whom I, I work with in the same company. We have not met because we, I joined during COVID. Um, I wanna just sort of step back, Kevin, if you, if, if you don't mind, I think there, 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 there's a, a simpler question, which is, you know, what is trade publishing versus academic publishing? The way that I, you know, we're all part of the trade publishing industry, um, unless you're an agent, I mean, you can sell to academic publishers, of course. You know, typically, uh, you know, the trade publishers are a general interest um, commercial publishing industry. Uh, we um, have all operational capacity from sales teams, you know, all the major big publishers, Hachette, Simon & Schuster, uh, Penguin Random House, we have sales teams, we have imprints, editorial teams, marketing teams, publicity teams, um, and we uh, are able to place our authors and books in all retail, um, you know, whether that's Walmart, Target, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, that kind of functionality, that kind of availability um, is what sort of shapes the general interest book market and the trade publishing um, industry. Academic publishing is a lot more specialized and it tends to, the way that I like to describe it, especially with academics who I work with quite a bit, um, academics have a captive audience. If you're an economist, you're communicating with other economists, you are debating, as one of my authors once told me, there's nothing you could do in an edit that would hurt me because the peer review process is so brutal. Um, when you're speaking with other academics, when you're building out your research or, or your particular kind of scholarship, that is the, your captive audience. Um, when you are writing for the trade, uh, you are writing for the general public. The general public is not a captive audience. They do not know about economics. They do not know about uh, current affairs at the level that you may. Um, they might read uh, any number of different newspapers. They might follow any number of different podcasts. They might have their own ways of engaging with the world. And general interest trade publishers are looking for ways to reach those audiences. So in terms of authors, especially scholars who are writing for the trade, they are writing for the public and you have to meet them where they are uh, and you have to communicate and persuade and write in a way that is very um, accessible. So I would say that's one of the big primary differences. Um, and often uh, with academic publishers, uh, it is very much a part of an academic's life uh, to develop you know, new scholarship, to build new ways of working um, within the field and moving the field forward. A trade economist uh, is not so much pushing forward, but introducing in many ways and persuading the public on many ideas. And so for many academics, they will write academic books as well as trade books. Um, and you might know some of the famous ones. Paul Krugman, for example, has several books um, that he's written for academic, um, which are for other economists. And of course, he's got you know The Life of a Liberal and all sorts of books that he's popularized, economic ideas for generations. So. Um, that's a sort of very simple, I think, way of framing it, um, if that's helpful. I think that's really, really great. Um, I'd love to have a general conversation with, with all the panelists and any of you can just jump in is, how does somebody move from a very specific topic to something that would be broader? What are the kinds of things that you need to think about in terms of audience and, um, and content to get to that broader side, that broader conversation? You done? Uh -huh. Yeah, I, yeah, I would I would say the best way to think about it, because this is an exercise I have. And Kevin, you were exposed to this when I, you know, we was talking um, to the gentleman who was doing the, the, the project. I don't want to speak to because I don't know where it's at in the pipeline, you know, but the way I have or, you know, 
every writer who I talk to for an author meeting, when they were talking about acquiring a book, you know, there's a lot of, what's the word? Loaded language in publishing about universal audience, broader, broader appeals, um, you know, mass appeal. Like what I like to really focus it on is about the, like all of the heart of marketing itself is about specificity and particularity. And it's knowing exactly who this book is written to which is different than who the book is, who the book is written for. So there are writers who write books on behalf of people, but knowing who that book is written to helps you identify how that book needs to look, right? So, you know, to build on what, you know, Pranoy was bringing up with the difference between trade and, you know, academic publishing, it's about where you find this book and who seeks a book out in this space, right? So if you are buying your books from independent books, bookstores, Barnes and Nobles, that means nine times out of 10, you're somebody who's, whose literary tastes are shaped in a way where when you go into a bookstore, you nine times out of 10 know what you're getting before you even arrive. If not that, you trust your ability to navigate those spaces with the confidence of, I, if I don't know this book, I trust, my taste elsewhere to kind of guide me through this other process versus if you're buying books from a Walmart, an Amazon, a, you know, a Target, nine times out of 10, you're there for toilet paper, you're there for diapers, you're there for groceries, you're there for a water cool, like you're there for so many other things that a book is something that you are getting mainly because probably you heard about it and there's an opportune, opportune moment where you see it and you think about it. But seldom people are beelining to target for the express purposes to buy a book. So in other words, what I immediately do when I, when I talk to um, any writer about how they conceive of their project, I have them do the exercise. If there's one person in your life who you would want to buy this book, they can't be family, they can't be famous, they can't be dead, who is that person? And usually what happens is a writer will, will anticipate and like assume that I'm speaking about markets and they'll be like, oh, this person is 42 years. No, I said, Give me a singular individual. And what the exercise is about is really thinking about, okay, even if you put this book on a bookshelf, who would be the person that would find it? What would their lives look like in order to even know that that book would be there? How would their lives already be set up? And what that does better than any publisher or agent can do is it immediately enables any writer to reverse engineer, wait, based on who I'm, who I want to buy this book, which is another thing I say is because if you work in this industry, you get paid to publish a book. We get paid, you get paid to write a book. I get paid to publish it. A person has to pay to read it. So immediately the relationship is different, right? You get paid to write a book. You have a very different relationship to someone who pays 16 to $30 for the book they, for the book they purchase. So even then the expectation is different. Now you're also thinking about if this person is not a practitioner of the industry you're in, they want something very different from the read than if you were writing for your esteemed colleagues, right? It's almost as though you go to a Beyonce concert with a friend who's a singer and you're not, and you're like, oh man, Beyonce could sing. And, and that person is like, her notes are flat. And it's like, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. I just know I like her voice. Like, when you are somebody who's a part of that like very you know studied class of people, the immediate thing you have to think about is the person for whom you want to buy this book, are they, are they a person who already knows what you know or are they a person you're trying to teach them what they don't know they don't know? And if you do, then you also have to think about what person would both, if there's a person who doesn't already have this knowledge why would they spend $30 for this knowledge? What am I presenting to them that would make them value it at a hardcover price between $27 and $30, right? And so all of these different frameworks start to inform because I believe that any writer is at heart, uh, what's that word? Savvy enough to begin to think there's a particular kind of book you have to write. So even if you're an economist or historian, I think about um, one of the one of the most prime examples. You you, you take somebody like um, not a traditional scholar, like scholar in the, in like the academic way, but we talk about uh, 
Eddie Gall Jr.'s book, Begin Again. Book came out about the, the essay collection about James Baldwin. He's traveling through, um, like journeying through like James Baldwin's life as a way to tell his own story. Now, this is a man who's a, you know, I think he's, he, he's like a distinguished professor at the, like, where is it? Uh, Princeton, I believe, one of the Ivy Leagues, right? Now he could have wrote that book like a standard, you know, university press book but he gave it the arc of story for a water pill. Now that book sold 89,000 copies. So another example, um, a better example is The Warmth of Other Sons. If you take the narrative structure from those three storylines of those people who, who went from down south to various parts of the country, and that book was just a, a, a book about the great migration policy, um, the arguments and statistics, that book does not cross over all because you stripped the story away. So I say that to say, you knowing who you're trying to reach, but at the same time, does this person, where does this person value lie in the translation of a, of a, of a purchase? It tells you, how do I package this material? Because that's really what a book is about. The ideas, you can keep the same ideas and arguments, but packaging them is determined largely by who you want to buy your book. Actually, Don, so, sorry, Kevin. I, I, that's, a, that's OK. I was going to bring Rachel into the conversation, but if you, you want to go first? No, no, no. Rachel, OK, um, so um, so I think you've touched upon one of the big bold words that I have is a narrative nonfiction. So getting people pulled into the story. And Rachel, I was going to have you talk about Layla Phillips' work, work um, and uh, which is just a fascinating concept. What a great lens. Uh, the book is called Beaverland, and I will let you talk about uh, the lens that she used to look at history and uh, and this mammal. Absolutely, I'd love to. Um, and actually, this question and sort of what Yudan was beautifully talking about also hits on another book that I acquired and published, which I happen to have right here, uh, called The Verge. Um, and to go off of that for just a second, Patrick is was an academic. He was he is a PhD credentialed historian, uh, medieval historian specifically. Um, but he decided, sort of after getting his PhD, he's like, I don't like writing for the academic market. I am a storyteller with this knowledge of you know currency and combat and all these sort of really interesting little bits of factotum that you know, yes, I could spill out in an academic book that a thousand people might read and will come away with some facts and figures for their papers, or I could tell stories about living, breathing people who existed in history and give it some narrative juice and really like draw people in. And that's exactly what he does. Um, he does it with a podcast, he does it with The Verge. Uh, Lila Phillip, who is sort of in that same um, milieu, she's not an academic, but she is a journalist uh, at the Boston Globe and a beautiful writer. Um, she's won awards for her writing. You know, she's very, very uh, sort of of that H is for Hawk. Uh, you know, uh, there's so many, you know, what is it? Soul of an Octopus, just, you know, the Book of Eels, all of these beautiful books that are coming out these days. Uh, that are literary narrative nonfiction. So they're beautifully written on the line level. They're narrative. So you've got an actual sort of beginning, middle, and end. You've got some kind of story arc, um, but it's also providing information. And that is such a beautifully, she does it in such a beautiful, beautifully balanced way, excuse me, um, because she's taking, she's doing a lot of things with this book. Um, she's taking this animal, just this one animal. And she has, by looking at the beaver specifically from basically since it was, since it evolved, literally, um, she traces American history through this one animal. And even for her, like writing, she, when I bought this book on a proposal, on her proposal, you know, it was a lot of it was about to do with the animal and current events, a lot of sort of local politics and, um, you know, the, you know, Republican hunters and things like that, like really more sort of uh, current events and uh, political machinations that feed into and are part of this animal's existence now. But in the process of researching this book, she has discovered 
how much Native American history naturally goes into this subject um, that has literally been whitewashed out of the overall narrative of this animal. Um, and so she, in the process of writing the book, she is doing active research, new research, um, and looking at things, paperwork, bills of, you know, uh, bills of, you know, land ownership and, uh, you know, so many new things that people haven't looked at. Literally, these are things that people haven't even seen in decades um, that she is digging up in the course of her research. And it all stemmed from her uh, living in Connecticut and having a beaver pond in her backyard with this stone, wall, like this man-made stone wall built around it. And she wanted to know what the story was there. And so it can sometimes even be that simple. You don't have, you know, there are people who have their expertise. There are people like Patrick Wyman, my other author, who is a medieval historian, and that is his niche. And that is what he writes in. And he does it beautifully and really, really excellently. Um, but then you have someone like Viola Phillip, who is a journalist who writes about all kinds of things uh, for her day job, as well as for her other books. But she, she, found and kind of she was hit with this one question right and she has followed that question now to groundbreaking research to you know levels and levels of sort of American history really peeling back literally like American history uh as told through the life and evolution of a beaver of all things like this thing that we don't really give a lot of thought to and on top of it all she writes beautifully which, you know, I myself, perf you know, sort of lean more literary in my tastes, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. And so, you know, she's not only giving you the information in terms of, so this is how this stone wall got built. She's describing it and she's describing it in summer, fall, winter, spring. She's telling you about the, you know, the fur trappers and John Jacob Astor who went down on the Titanic. And it's just, there's a, there are so many ways to tell a story and Lila in particular, as an example, she does it beautifully, she does it expertly, but she doesn't, and same with Patrick, uh, she doesn't condescend. And I think that that's a really important thing to always sort of bear in mind as, you know, as people who are experts in your field, um, whatever that field is or whatever that subject is or the niche, um, is that, you know, and I think speaking to what Pernoy and uh, Yadon were saying earlier in terms of like, who are you trying to reach, right? If you are coming at it from this perspective of like, and you, it's usually unconscious too, I wanna to specify this. I'm not saying that anyone's going out there and being like, well, I know more than you and I'm gonna tell you how much more I know. It's this unconscious thing of like, because you know so much, you don't think, oh, I have to explain what this is and this is and this is. You just keep going. And I think the measure of a great narrative nonfiction writer is their ability to know their subject inside and out, be willing to learn new things about it, like Lila, and then to write about it in a way, and this is also where a good editor comes in, is to then pull the threads apart a little bit, you know, sort of pull that overall sort of woven history apart for the layman, for the people who are just walking through Target or the tables at the Strand or wherever you happen to be. And you see a book with, for instance, Beaverland will have a beaver on the cover. And it's like, well, what is it about a beaver that warrants an entire book? And lo and behold, this is, it, this is our Nate, like country's history in a nutshell, if anything. Um, but she's not, Lila doesn't take anything for granted. She doesn't assume that everyone knows what she knows. She's coming at it from this perspective of, I want to share what I, what I knew, what I know now, and what I have learned over the course of writing this book. Um, so it's almost like a level of humility that goes into the narrative storytelling itself that I think makes her an especially good uh, narrative nonfiction book. That is awesome. Thank you, Rachel. And you like led me perfectly into really talking about um, the, one of the keywords you word used was proposal. And this is where having an agent on your side to help you build something to understand what the marketing is like and understand all the different what the, all the different editors are looking for um, can really come into to um, use. And Rico, I'd love to uh, turn it over to you. Um, you're an agent. 
What does that mean? What do you do? How do you find clients? What stage do clients come to you in? Do you, how do you, do you work with them on proposals? And then how the heck do you know how to sell it? Um, I really enjoyed hearing everyone's responses to that question. And uh, just to speak to Rachel for a second, uh, one of my colleagues worked on Beaverland and it is such a good book. I'm so excited for it. Um, and yeah. Um, well, an agent, um, we get to wear a lot of hats. We, um, an agent is, uh, the rep represents the author and sort of is their business partner in crime, um, their creative collaborator, their editor before a book is sold. Um, and we are the ones that, um, I guess, to explain the pipeline, we, um, we help when we sign a client, we help them um, develop a book. So for nonfiction um, can come in at all different stages, but if it's sort of a formative stage, we really help the author um, think about the focus, the structure, what story they want to tell. Um, like Yaron was touching on, um, who are they writing this? What is the audience they're writing to? Because um, those are all important things to think about in terms of a book's saleability and reach and what um, imprints and publishers we want to approach when, when the time comes and the proposal is submission ready. Um, and then it's also our job to sort of be a matchmaker and find those, have relationships and know those editors that are going to be really excited about the project. Um, it's our job to sort of suss out different editors' wish lists, their tastes, um, what type of books they're looking to acquire at their specific imprint, um, and to um, you know target those editors when we go on submission with a project. And then um, when a book is sold, we the agent is the person who negotiates the the contract on behalf of the author. Um, uh, we handle, you know, the deal terms, um, you know, what rights we give to the publisher, what rights the author might reserve. Um, we also handle the subsidiary, what's called the subsidiary rights to the book. So um, oftentimes if, if the, the author um, does not sell uh, foreign, like translation and UK rights or um, audio, although audio more and more these days are, are being handled by the publisher, Oftentimes an agent will have a foreign rights agency within the agency that handles those and they work with co-agents all around the world in different territories who specialize um, in books for their own countries and languages. Um, so we, we just, we do a variety of things. Um, and sorry, what was your second question? Was it about the proposal, Connor? Kevin? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. How, so um, how do you work with people on proposals? Yeah. Um, so there's no real, I would say, and I'm curious to hear what everyone else, all the other panelists have to say, but there's no real, like, I would say formula or blueprint. There's no, um, there's no one, there's no one way to skin a proposal. Um, it sort of calls for um, it's a it's on a project by project basis how that proposal takes shape, but there are certain essential components that I think every um, good proposal has and certain um, sections. So typically a book proposal will have an overview that sort of um, defines the focus and um, the message of a book um, in a very succinct, compelling way. And then they'll have an author bio that talks about the author's various credentials, their publication record. Um, there'll be a, a marketing and promotion section, which uh, focuses on what the author brings to the table in terms of partner, partnering with the publisher and their platform and how they can help um, promote and sell the book. Um, and then their there's usually a chapter by chapter breakdown or what are called chapter summaries um, that uh, just short sort of like one or two paragraph synopses of each chapter by the book. So you sort of get a snapshot and can 
glean from the chapter by chapter summary is sort of the overall narrative arc of the book. Um, and then lastly, depending on the project um, and the nature of the project, there's usually a, a sample chapter or two at the end of the proposal um, to really sort of showcase um, you know, the author's writing style um, and um, their voice and um, uh, what, what the fully written book is going to sort of read like. Because oftentimes, um, as many of you know, many nonfiction books, especially by scholars or academics or, you know, journalists or what have you, require, often require just, you know, months and months, if not years of research and travel and going into archives or, you know, interviews. And they can't afford to write the full book before it's sold to a publisher. So a proposal is really a short form document that shows that is a roadmap to what the eventual book will look like. Um, I think that's all. That's great. That's great. I would I'd love to open this one up to everybody. It's like, where do you get a proposal format? What's the best way to find a proposal uh, format that works? And then how the heck do you find an agent? Oh, so, I mean, I can answer that if you would like. Go for it. Go for it. I tell everybody this. Your book is like a treasure. It's, it's like a map. In the back of every book, at least trade books, there's an acknowledgments page. I don't know how many people read this page. But this page is like a blueprint. It literally tells you who the agent was on the book, who the editors were, who were the team that was behind this book. And, you know, it's almost like people watching a film and want to be in film and you're not looking at those names. Like, who's the, you know, who's the person on the boom mic? Who's this person? Who's the grip? Who's that? So as writers, people who want to work into move into this industry, I think it, it behooves all of you to begin to really think about the industry as such that there are multiple people and multiple positions who make a book work. I typically say this to writers all the time, the act of writing is a, is a, is a, is a solitary one, but the act of publishing is a communal one. So once you say you want to publish a book, you are by virtue saying you are no longer doing it alone. You need a team. So I would say in terms of at first finding agents, Go to some of your favorite books by scholars that you respect and look at their acknowledgments. Start to take those names down. Start to see what agencies you start to you start to see like show up. What publishers you see are typically doing work like this. What editors are doing the type of work, and then you start to build your understanding of how to actually pitch these agents um, on representing you. I can't tell you often enough, and I don't know Ray, Rico, Rico, am I pronouncing it right? I'm sorry. Oh, it's Rico. Rico like Seiko the watch. With the okay, <laughs> Rico, my, my apologies. Like I can't, in, in Pranoy, if this is your, your experience, how different it is when someone actually takes the time to have done their research about who they're like submitting to. Like, I can't tell you how many times I get white label emails that I'm like, your writing is not that good to be white label, right? So, the point at which someone tells me that they did their research and I can see the research show up and they're just even how they approach me. You're, I'm, I can speak for myself. I open those emails and I read through those emails a lot more than the person who's like, hey, you, you want to read, you, 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 like they just jump straight into the pitch. It's like, no, hello, no, good afternoon. No, like, hey, I know you just acquired this book and I think you will like that. It, showing that you have an equal curiosity and interest into your future collaborators is the best way to not only find an agent, but to secure one. Because that relationship is a long one. You don't necessarily immediately sell a book, even when you get agent representation. It's, you know, writers who have agents for years before they land something. And you want an agent who believes in your project, not just the transactional value of what they think they can and can't get. But if you lead that journey being transactional, you're going to receive that energy back. So look for the people who like are doing the work that you really respect. Uh, I, I love that. Um, and I completely 100% agree because that is exactly like that's literally what I tell people constantly, right, is to go into the acknowledgement section of your, you know, the the book that you read that made you maybe inspired to 
you to write or start thinking about writing your book and find out who their agent is. And also keeping in mind that it's 2021 and social media exists. Like the, the resources that are available to people now, plus the sheer number of agents that just exist, um, it's incredible. And it's no longer this world of uh, stuffy, with apologies, Connor, Kevin, stuff, you know, stuffy white men in, in mahogany offices, just so, sort of all playing with the same ball. We are now in this wonderful world where there are, there are the Reikos for the right person and the, the Pernoys for the right person, and the Adons for the right person. And ev- like, there is someone, if you have the, you know, the story to tell and you tell it well, um, like it's, it's so possible. And as you know, said, like doing the research into the person that you are submitting to in terms of getting an agent. And I say this entirely from the editor's perspective, but um, it counts for so much, even to just go onto their Twitter and just see who this person is. You don't have to follow them, but I recommend usually that you do, um, even if you never say anything to them on that platform, but just, it's a way of seeing who these people are as people, not just an agent or an editor or anyone in the industry. Because as uh, Yadon said, these are these are your colleagues essentially that you are scoping out um, or your potential colleagues and your you know, potential coworkers essentially. Um, and you don't wanna work with people you don't know and don't have anything in common with. So don't, don't go for the big name agent, you know, sort of the one agent name you know because it's the one agent that you've ever heard of. You know, don't just submit to everyone at writer's house because that's the only agency you've heard of do the research, you know, it's time intensive, but if you do the research and you dig and, you know, maybe go out on a limb, get a month's subscription to like Publishers Marketplace, take advantage of that, get everything you need out of it, and then, you know, X out of that membership. It's 20 bucks to get basically the, the best resource into finding an agent that I can, besides like Twitter and the books that you read that I can think of. That is the that is the dirty little secret. Yeah, exactly. I don't like to tell people. There's, there's a, don't tell anyone, but Publishers Marketplace has everything. Uh, yeah. Um, and there's also this cure query tracker. There's um, there's a hashtag. Was it uh, um, manuscript wish list? Was it M M W L S? M S W L. Okay, that makes it more sense. Man- manuscript M S W L. Um, there's lots of, if you just even Google how to find your, um, your, uh, an agent, you will, you'll get some, um, you'll get some traction. I actually do want to, there were a couple of great questions here. And as an agent, I would like to find these answers out. Um, somebody said, would you please talk about the book financials? And can you t- share the algorithm that is used to determine what the signing figure is for an author? So I would like, I would like an answer to that. I have an idea, but. Anyone? Crickets? Wait, say it again. Sorry. So how, how do you decide what the advance is? Bernoy, do you want to take it? I'm just being mindful of like, like how much space I occupy. So I'm, take it. I, I mean, I, I think uh, one thing I was going to say is that if we all unmute each other, we can hear each other, talk to each other and decide how. how to Fair enough. Let's I, do it. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to get into that. I think the, the one thing to keep in mind, though, and I actually wanted to build off of what Rachel and Reiko and Yadon were saying. Um, um, I, I, the, so I, I taught, look, there's two different ways that I, um, when I've had this conversation in the past, and this differs for academics and say journalists, right? Uh, if you're an academic, you, as part of the discipline, as part of the, the work, writing is it's part of the job and building out scholarship is part of the job. Um, Yadon mentioned Eddie Glad. You know, Eddie is a very interesting example because he is a scholar at Princeton. He published several books on religion uh, for university presses, and he continues to publish at university right. presses. It was, in fact, another book that came out the same year that James Baldwin book was published that um, I read Eddie's book. I loved it. I also read an academic press book by Nicholas Bacola, um, and that was a very specific book on Baldwin's debate with Buckley at Cambridge. Um, And that book uh, was published by University Press, terrific book. 
600 page, pages long. And it really explored that debate and how to synthesize and understand that debate through a, a terrific historian, I believe also at Princeton. Now, the, the, the thing that I often run into when I talk to journalists or writers, and I think this is slightly different for memoirists, um, is the book, the first question you wanna ask yourself is, is this a book? And what I often tell people, I speak to journalists, I've worked with several journalists, can you write it in 6,000 words? Because then you've written an article. Can you write it over the course of a series of articles? I've spoken to journalists, in fact, I think I've spoken to a few journalists who are part of the Columbia Journalism School who uh, have been investigating dirty money trails. And they say, you know, I have this great story, I've been covering this beat. And it says, you know, well, why don't you pitch the AP? Why don't you pick the, to pitch the Times? Why don't you pitch the Huffington Post? Is that your book or is that your investigative story of the moment? A book is a long-term investment. It is, you, you, you are putting together three to five years of your life committing to this. If some people don't have, they, they, the more, when you think about it in, in, that sen in that sense of scope, I mean, look at all of the people. So you, Kevin mentioned Simon Shama, Jill Lepore, and um, Jelani Cobb. Jelani Cobb uh, is one of my favorite people. Um, look at all of the articles he's written for the New Yorker. He's turned none of those into books, okay? He's, ri he's written book reviews. He's written about uh, the, the, the summer of 2020. He's written about uh, George Floyd. He's written about DC politics. He's written about all sorts of things. And yet he's also written books, but he's decided what are books and what are articles. Um, I've worked with, uh, you know, I, I've worked with a reporter who has been writing for a local newspaper in Missouri. He won the Pulitzer Prize in 2018, uh, putting a face to uh, impoverished Americans who have been completely sacked by debtors' prisons, which is just in America and we don't really acknowledge it. And he's been writing these stories for close to 20 years. I, after doing it for so long and actually changing some of the political decision-making that was going on in, in, in the state house of Missouri, once it became clear that this problem was destroying the you know, poor populations in Missouri, um, he decided that he, he wanted to take this story national. But it took him a long time to figure out who his characters were, what the situation was. He was a beat reporter in the courthouse. And he did that for decades before, and he was writing for a paper. So the first question you wanna ask yourself is, I, I like to say, the, the simplest way to put it is the book is the last step. If you can't put it in any other format, but the book, then you might actually have a book. If you can put it in any other format, you know, the, the one of my favorite and sometimes frustrating and sometimes exciting uh, journeys with a first time author is realizing that writing 8,000 words is very different than writing 80,000 words. When you write 80,000 words, you have to actually build out characters. You have to tell a story. You have to broaden out a scope. You have to have layers. You have to have dimensions. You have to have secondary characters. You need to have atmosphere. You need to have none of those things in you when you write 4,000 words. Some people write 300 words. So, you know, if you're a blogger. So I think that the first thing you wanna ask yourself, and this is not a compromising situation at all, it's a, it's a way to develop and flex your creative talent, is to first write the 300 words, then write the 4,000 words, and then decide, wow, it took me three months to write 4,000 words. I'm done with that story. I've moved on, I've pivoted, I've got something else in me. If that's the case, then why would you wanna spend five years on this subject, the, the, the amount of time you will be spending writing this book, working on this book, promoting this book, finding that community, meeting your agent, all of this. So the book is the last step. And I think it's at that stage, if you wanna think of it as a sort of climax, where you become fully invested in the now future that will be committed by yourself, the sweat equity that will be involved to make sure that you do everything to position yourself for the other side of this. Now, the other side of this, Yadon and Rachel have been talking about very effectively, Rachel has been talking about. I think of this as the entrepreneurial side. 
when you become, when you decide that it is in fact the book, I have now, there's no format for me. I can't be a pod, I've seen, I'm a podcaster. It's not working. I, I got the book. I, I'm not, I can't pitch the Hush, Huffington Post is too big of a story. Or I've pitched, I've done like 30, 40, 50, 60 articles on this. I've got the larger story. I'm going to go from what, you know, the talk piece to Jane Mayer's Dark Money. I've got the entire story in it. So that's not, I can't do that in 5,000 words. I can do that in 200,000 words. Or I want to tell, and, you know, I tried to buy a book uh, earlier this summer that was going to tell the story of World War II from the developing world. So not from Europe. What was happening around? Um, the, well, that is not something that you can tell in the New York Times. And that is not something that you can even tell in the Atlantic. I was speaking with Adam Serwer of the Atlantic. I was the underbidder on his book. Um, he's been writing essays, viral essays for the Atlantic. In fact, he's sort of become one of their leading political commentators. Uh, there is so many essays that he's written, but what was his book? And I'm not going to spoil it. I know what it is. Unfortunately, I won't be publishing it, but I, I, uh, it took him a long time. He'd been reporting on DC. He'd been thinking very deeply about American politics and American history, and he'd been writing terrific essays. But what was his book? It took him a long time to figure that out. And I'm very grateful. And I think that when I when we see it, it's going to be very, very special because it is, in fact, something that I've never seen before. And I, I, I can't wait for it. When you get to the, okay, I can't do any, it is, it is a book. Then you get to the entrepreneurial side. And the entrepreneurial side, I think, is very, very important. That's when you read the acknowledgments page. That's when you realize that you are going to have to you know, develop or flex another side of yourself. You're going to have to understand the business side of it. You know, so don't send blank emails to whoever the hell you want. What you, you know, there are agents who specialize in nonfiction. There are agents who specialize with journalists. There are publishers who specialize in certain kind of publishing. There are commercial publishers that publish Bravo stars and TV stars and memoirs from all sorts of people. There are places like where Yadon works that publishes a lot of DC bigwigs and a lot of history. Uh, some of the biggest names in uh, history come out of Simon & Schuster. There are places like where Rachel works that publishes a lot of current affairs books and has its own kind of publishing model. Little Brown, you know, we've done Pete Souza's book on uh, Obama portraits. We've done Infinite Jest. We've done, we published James Patterson who's the best selling author of all time. Every publisher has a different Norton. Jill Lepore, who is published by Norton, who has a very strong academic uh, department and they move very conveniently between academic and trade publishing. It's very appealing to academics to work in that to be published by them because their 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 ability to tap into the academic market and, and the academic community is very, very strong. Uh, they publish academics um, uh, and, and don't care so much about the commercial side of things. So I think that side of it, the entrepreneurial side of it. Is, is something that becomes a second instinct. And I think that's very important to develop because it's gonna be very important for the, um, that part of it, the, the journey into getting the right agent. There are agents who represent, you know, when, when Yadon says, you know, look at the acknowledgements page, why is that important? Well, that's important because that agent was interested in this book. And if they were interested in this book and this book is like your book, they might be interested in your book. And not all agents have the same interests, just like not all readers have the same interests, just like not everybody has the same book. So that entrepreneurial side, we can get into that in greater detail, and I'm sure everybody has their own thoughts on it, but I, I think that that's a that's yeah. an important dynamic. I think Yudan had something, and I was yeah. going to have a, I have a follow-up for you, Yudan, as well, so. No, so really quickly, just to help you, I hope y'all understand the landscape, and this is to give you, illuminate you know, questions, even sometimes for agents, like how do y'all even come up with these numbers? So I think last year there was an article posted by the New York Times that showed that like publishing had one of its best year in print in print sales in a long time, right? Uh, the two areas that sold the most were backlist titles, and I'll explain what backlist titles are, and titles by people who are celebrities, people with huge public platforms, like we're talking in the millions, not, not hundreds of thousands, but in the millions. So we're talking about backlist titles, meaning books. When a book is published, so if a book came out today, a book has a year from the point of publication to, that 
determines its commercial viability. So 2022 next year, the, if your book earns back its advance, it's profitable. If it doesn't, it lost money. Now, think about what it means for one of the biggest revenue generating book, I mean, years in publishing, where two of the biggest books, two of the highest performing books in terms of sales were either books that came out after the window in which we determine profitability or someone who has a big name. What does that mean? The same article showed that 98% of books by debut authors sold less than 5,000 copies. I'm going to repeat that number. 98% of the people who, I mean, of debut authors sold less than 5,000 copies. Now, depending on what publisher you, you're at, the, well, I'll speak for the one I'm at, there is an idea, the ability um, to, if I look at a book, the belief I have to, fr the, uh, the framework I have to operate from is, can, do we believe this book can sell 10 to 20,000 copies, right? That's the framework. But even what I'm negotiating as an editor, if I'm publishing a debut author, who I just saw the data that told me that this book has a 98% chance of selling less than 5,000 copies, regardless of how other people at the house think about it, I have to start thinking differently about the trajectory of this writer's career. Meaning, if you're a writer, what you have to consider is what type of trajectory are you looking for as a writer? Are you looking for the type of trajectory where you can publish you know, several books over the course of a career? Or is this your one and done, right? One of the, per the, the best literary trajectories I can give is Toni Morrison. Her first book, Jesus, I have these automated lights and it would shut off as I'm talking. <laughs> um, so Toni Morrison published her first book in 1970, The Blue Assize. So 2,500 copies. Her next, her bestseller, her, her bestseller doesn't come till 17 years later with Beloved, right? Now we got four books in between um, four books and 17 is between her first book and her bestseller. She doesn't win a Nobel till about five years after her bestseller. The whole point of it was she was building a literary career. Very different than the type of books in which you you know you hear about these six and seven figure deals. And last year we also talked about the uh, you know publish and pay me debate about you know writers revealing what they got paid. What I'm continuing to learn on the inside is that that conversation was necessary, but incomplete. What I mean is what we needed to continue to look at is what did people's second, third, fourth, fifth advances look like, right? Because the person who may have gotten six figures or seven figures, the question becomes, did they ever get that again? Versus somebody who got, you know, under 50,000 and then they went on to win awards or build a respectable readership. Bet you they won't share how much they're getting paid now. I put money, they will not tell you what those advances look like now. The That's reason awesome. why. So, and, sorry. Hmm? Go ahead. I was going to ask you a, a different question, but go, oh, go, go. The, I, I, say that to, I say that to say in this industry, the thing that I'm even calibrating is that I'm thinking about when I'm assessing a writer's value, what I'm assessing is the long term value. Now you can't assess that on the PNL, and what the PNL is is like a profit and loss statement that we generate looking at comp titles, where we go on this thing called book scan. We look at book sales, and we like look at books like the book we're trying to put out, and we go, what are the chances that this book does what this other book does? Now that's just a baseline for a number, but then what can happen with that number is the ex expertise or the insight of the published, the publicity team, the marketing team, the people who have this, who have. Uh, what's it called? Experience publishing those kind of books will go, yeah, I might like this book, but not for $100,000. You know why? Is because we're, th the publisher has to hedge their bets. So one of the things that um, Rico said, I hope I said it right this time. Did I say it right? Look, Rico. Rico. I'm going to get it. I'm not going to stop till I get it. Rico. Yes? Ray. Ray. Rico. Boom. Okay. Rico said is uh, about the, the, the book proposal, the best way to think about the book proposal is like, a, is like a business plan. And the best way to think about the advance is like a business investment. So there are people who quit their jobs because they got an advance. That's like you opening a pizza parlor, you getting a loan from the bank to start the pizza parlor and then you go buy a Ferrari. That is not money to buy a Ferrari. That is money 
to make the pizza parlor. In other words, the money you get to do a book is not money to like lavish yourself with. It's money to invest into the production of the book because until that book is profitable, you have to like really think of yourself like a small business. You're an independent contractor. So Toni Morrison did not quit her job at Random House until the royalties from her books paid her. Oh, you shaking your head no? No, 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 no. No, I agree. Oh, no, 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 no. I know this. I know yeah. this. Toni Morrison sold that book as an editor at Random House, didn't tell anybody at Random House that she wrote a book, sold it to Henry Holt, the Henry Holt. He was a man at the time. And um, the editor-in-chief of Random House, who was the former editor-in-chief of Simon & Schuster, got, got learned about it, Gottlieb, whose paperback I worked on, it's in his memoir. He wrote, writes about this. They all discovered at Random House that their colleague, Toni Morrison, had just published a book <laughs> Yeah. They all read it because they were curious what Tony's book was like. They were so, Gottlieb was so moved by it. He said, Tony, you can't come back to work. You need to go write. Right. You need to leave. And she, recall, she, she recalls that as a turning point for her, but, but it's true. She, the, you know, the interesting thing about the big advance, you know what changed it? It all changed with Cold Mountain. If you look at, all book advances before Cold Mountain came out, there was no such thing as the blockbuster. It, it completely changed the industry. Anyway, that that's yeah. Um, so we, we are just to tie up, just to tie it up. Basically, what the PNL is informed by is about how do we hedge our risk as a publisher. So oftentimes, what can happen on the face of on the other side of an agent or a writer, if you get a low advance it might seem like the publisher is devaluing your work. But what it, what I'm here to say is that what it says is that we're investing into a long-term trajectory because we see you as having more than one book. Usually when you see six and seven figure book deals, that usually is like its own like scarlet letter because that book has to do well. Yep. There is no room for failure with books like that. And you don't get a second go at those. So I'm just saying that to say when you as you are moving out in the world and you get like advances, think about the trajectory of the career you want, because the, the high number is not what it what it means all the time. Exactly. Um, and to speak to that point about PLs, uh, the profit loss statements, uh, a huge factor, both in your proposal writing of it, as well as the acquisitions process that Gidon is talking about are comp titles. And comp titles are both a blessing and a curse because comp titles or comparative titles can be used by you in your proposal to tell first an agent and then an editor, what, where does your book fit on the shelf that you're sort of aiming for? So if you're writing about, for instance, to use my author Lila as an example again, Sorry, Kevin, do you want to say Can that? I just interrupt? So if you do have a question, please type it in now and 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 we'll I'll start compiling them. We have about uh, 10 minutes left, but uh, Rachel, please go and I'll kind of, I'm, I'm going to start doing rapid fire questions sure. after this. For sure, I'll go fast. But anyway, com title, so like Lila's book, Beaverland, right? I got that proposal in and she has a great section on what other books are, her book is similar enough to that they sort of live on the same shelf together, but they're not identical books. That's great in terms of figuring out the marketing for the book, the publicity for the book, sort of what model we want to follow. Um, but the tyranny of the comp titles is also an issue because then when you're trying to acquire a book, when Yadon or Pernod or I are trying to acquire a book, for instance, from Reiko, then it becomes, well, this is a really, you know, this project seems like it has a lot of potential but none of your comps have sold enough copies, copies to like instill confidence in the publisher and the rest of the people who are actually in charge of letting you pay money to acquire a book. Um, so it's a real double-edged sword in terms of comp titles, but it is something that you need to, to take into consideration. And basically you kind of like for whenever an editor is trying to acquire a book, I literally will spend hours just looking for comp titles that have done 
that are similar enough to the book I'm trying to acquire that have done well enough just to convince the people above me to let me acquire the book. Um, but it, but it is an, another issue sort of within this process that kind of came to light, uh, last year, especially on top of the publishing paid me hashtag and things like that is, well, if you're just going to rely on comp titles to determine what you're going to acquire, who you're, what, what you're going to let editors acquire, then that's just going to continue to, uh, like the circle continues, like this vicious cycle continues of, you're just gonna keep saying, seeing the same kinds of people writing these books. And so we're trying, currently internally, it feels like there's this sort of push at least to try and break away from that a little bit to give authors who maybe don't have the strongest calm titles, you know, or don't have a lot of publications to their name to give them the benefit of that doubt and say, well, regardless, like this deserves you know, this author needs X amount of money or somewhere in this range so that they can travel to whatever location they need to go to, to do this research, right? Uh, Excellent. Excellent. So I was gonna, there's some questions that have come in about what the what what kind of platform a writer should have. Reiko, can you talk ab about when you start looking at, um, at authors how much do you value their platform? Do you try to get them to build a platform before you go out to editors? How big a part of that, of, of your decision-making is that, uh, is that? Oh man, such a good question. It's a big question. Um, I, I've always skewed more literary in my tastes and um, the nonfiction writers that I have been working with, um, have not been scholars, they've been journalists. Um, well, actually I'm working with a histor an oral historian right now, um, but many of them don't have PhDs um, and many of them have, work have, have published academic titles but are now looking to move into the trade market. And um, I think it's sort of a case by case basis where I look at how um, you know it? How big of a hill are we going to have to climb together to overcome any reluctance by the publisher that they're trying to you know quote unquote break them out in the trade market after having an academic background where you know they've had m minimal sales because it's a more specialized market. But I would say, I mean. Uh, I, I, I want to hear the editor's take on this, but I, I think it just really comes down to the idea. Um, and if they have, I think most writers that I work with are very credentialed. They've, they're journalists, they've published in newspapers, magazines of note, they have um, um, an academic background, but they're not, um, you know, necessarily like, doing a lot of, um, you know, they're not like having a viral TED talk or they're not like a celebrity scholar or something like that. Um, and it really, when that's the case, um, they don't have, maybe they don't, have, they're not super active on social media, but for me, it really just comes down to the idea and the story and how we can position it through, um, through the writing of the proposal itself and the comp titles. Um, I think I'm a bit more of an idealist than some agents on this, um, but for me, it really comes down to the story um, and how big of an idea I think it is. And then we sort of um, come up with a strategy in terms of selling them if they don't have a massive platform to work from. I don't know if that answers, it's a big question. I don't think that's just a part of it in my opinion, but yeah. Something we have about three minutes left, but go, go something ahead. Something I was going to build on too is that it's public speaking. Um, mm -hmm. What publishers, what our publicity and marketing team is also thinking about is what shows can we put you on? Like, can we put you across from Terry Gross? Can we put you on Good Morning America? Like, are you the type of person like that? Eddie, coming back to Eddie Gold as an example, he did that talk. Like, I forgot what thing that went viral with him talking about the Trump administration. And he like just distilled this assessment that was like a two minute clip. And that like made him like 
a, like a household name overnight. Think about the like the Cornell West, like these people who, because of their presence and their charisma and these things, it helped. I'm not saying you it, like this is a make or break, but right. as a publisher and as a marketer, like the marketing and publicity team are immediately thinking about where can we, where can this person, where can we put them? Can we put them in front of Trevor Noah's? Can we put them in front of, are they going to be the type of people who people are going to care about? So this is also a part of the package of what you do as a scholar, right? It's also how do you present yourself to a broader public? Yeah. And so that's something to consider as well, because that's something, you know, the house also looks at. Excellent. Can we have time? <laughs> so I, we have time for this one last question. Let me see which, what was this last question? Was this about the, um, is there a way, is there anything specific that you're looking for in a scholarly writer to take them on board, um, to make them part, part of something bigger? Is it, do any journals make a difference? Uh, does, does tenure make a difference? Does having a master's versus a PhD or a PhD versus a master's? I, I told someone in the, in the chat, but, you know, a PhD, who said, you know, they have a PhD, but they haven't really been published a lot. The PhD counts for a lot. Um, a master's counts for a lot. I mean, you're at 12 as an, as just one example, like we have, like we've published someone like Patrick Wyman, who is a credentialed PhD in medieval historian, <clears throat> but we've also published a book by an armchair historian. He has no credentials. He's been, he literally was only published miraculously in the New York times. Like, of course he managed to hit the home run sort of at the first, on the first try. Uh, but it was just this tiny little column that he wrote about the Civil War that was sort of buried underneath the rest of the paper that uh, my manager, the publisher of 12, read. Um, and this guy displayed, a, you know, the knowledge uh, required to tell the story that he wanted to tell. Um, so it's sort of, it's a, like, it's, annoyingly, it's a little arbitrary, but at the same time, it's like, you just have to trust and show confidence in your knowledge and your subject. And it is a little bit of a bullshit game, but it's also just, you know, like just trust that you know what you're talking about. And if you trust that you know what you're talking about, so will the person that you're trying to sell your book to, whether it's the agent, the agent, the editor, whomever, or, you know, or when you're having your author conversation your author call with a, a potential editor, that's what you bring to the table is I, you know, I may not have this, this, and this, but I know what I'm talking about. Um, you know, back, just, just like when you were doing your math homework in middle school, show, if, as long as you show your work, the, like the rest kind of speaks for itself, but you're already just by virtue of where you are at Columbia, getting your, you know, your deg graduate degrees, you're already, You've already you're already there like you don't need a a stable uh you know you don't need 20 items on your uh cv to to show like to prove that you know what you're talking about um there's you know it doesn't it, you don't have to exhaust yourself to do that just just trust awesome and i think with that we are we are at our final lightning round and i asked everybody to bring um the one project that they're really most excited about um, and I just just go. Um, uh, Reiko, you want to kick it off? Yeah. Um, so I think I'm allowed to talk about it. I haven't actually. I've been working on it still, but I haven't gone out with, with it. It's um, it's a book called uh, Mayor of the Tenderloin, um, and it's by an oral historian. Her name is Allison Owings. Um, who wrote a, uh, a book that was a New York Times notable book about um, following women from the Third Reich, white German women and how they felt about Hitler. And she has a, she, so she, and she's followed it American waitresses. She's written a book about Native Americans, but this particular book, she's been following a man named Del Seymour for the last six years. He lives in the Tenderloin district of San Francisco and he was homeless and addicted to crack for over 20 years. And he then went on to found in his um, sobriety, a transformative job readiness program for the homeless um, uh, 
community in the Tenderloin, which is basically the skid row of San Francisco called Code Tenderloin. And it um, has become the sort of blueprint for how to confront the homelessness crisis in America. Um, so he was, he was recently profiled in the New York Times and he's done some, some TED Talks and he just has an incredible life story. So the, because she's an oral historian, she's able to um, sort of efface herself as the author and weave together interviews. So it comes in very um, immediate storytelling way, which is how she's always written books, but it talks about him, his life story um, paired with his development of this incredible program. It reminds me a lot. There's this book, one of my favorite books of all time is called Tattoos on the Heart, um, written by this Jesuit priest who started Homeboy Industries in LA. But this is about a black man in his community in the Tenderloin District who walked in those shoes and then formed this incredible program. Um, so I'm, I'm super excited about it. And she sort of builds out this world the neighborhood of the Tenderloin becomes a character in itself. She follows other people who are working um, different parts of this um, issue in the neighborhood. So social workers, you know, people who, um, you know, pol politicians, local politicians, and then Del Seymour, who's known as the mayor of the Tenderloin, is sort of at the center of the story. Um, so I'm super excited about it. That's awesome. I, I know we're going a little over a little bit, but I want- Sorry, that was long-winded, but I'm, that's okay. I got Everyone, carried away in my- You got in the it. story. You Don, I know that you just, you're you're a relatively new hire. I don't know if you have anything coming up that you can yeah. talk about. I got, yeah, I, I got, I acquired six. I'm, it's my first one. It's the literary short story collection by a writer named Alia Bilal. Um, and I found it through a video I, I posted. It's a, it's a literary nonfiction um, short story collection about um, the lived ex the interior lives and lived experiences of Black Muslims in a nation of Islam and Sunni communities. So one of the things I realized is like the nation of Islam has been in this country since the 1800s, and there has never been a work of high literary fiction that represents that community at all. Most of the writing that represents, that even depicts and portrays Black Muslims in this country has largely been nonfiction books. And so what would it mean to have, you know, these people who have been in this country for a long time be represented artfully, right? And so like, that's what I'm most excited about. Awesome. Pernoy? Again, you, you're, just, you're just at a new place, but I don't know yes, what your acquisition um, pipeline is like. The, uh, the some stuff I'll, I'll i'll mention two um one is a book that i'm very very proud of it came out over the summer it's called aftershocks um it's co-authored uh one of the authors the don's the, giving you the pump the uh the the, uh, the former national security advisor to then vice president joe biden he is currently serving as the highest civilian member of the pentagon uh, at the department of defense and the other author is a china expert at the brookings institute and I signed the book up in April of 2020, and they basically, wow. through their agent, told me that the COVID-19 crisis was going to be a global inflection point in the way that 1989 was, in the way that um, 1914 was, uh, 1918 was, um, in the way that 2001 was. And of course, I had been two weeks uh, working from home and uh, had no idea whether that was gonna be true or not. I have not gone back since then. Um, and so we worked on this book. Uh, it, they told the entire global story of COVID-19 as it was unfolding um, by communicating with governments around the world and uh, the World Health Organization. And really, I thought was an enriching story. One really uh, sort of hilarious or ironic or sad, I don't know. Um, the first part of the book, they, they synthesized the impact that the um, 1918 flu had on the end of World War I. Um, what they argue is that basically it ended the war sooner than it did and actually compromised Germany, which led us on the path during the interwar year, uh, years towards World War II. And that Woodrow Wilson, who got sick with the flu, was unable to create the League of Nations in the way that he had envisioned it. Um, 
we finished that chapter just as Trump got sick with COVID. So I remember texting them and saying, is this history repeating themselves? And they both <laughs> looked at me and said, I, I have no idea. This is the craziest thing I've ever seen. And there's a, that book has been out. Uh, it came out over the summer. Um, Susan Rice and, and all sorts of people have, have flirted and supported Samantha Power. Um, there's a book coming out in five weeks and it's called American Kleptocracy. If anybody has been following along, uh, along with the Washington Post, the Pandora Papers that has been saying how billionaires have been hiding their money in offshore tax havens. Well, it turns out that there's a book that explains exactly how this happened. Um, it comes from a financial reporter, his name is Casey Michelle, and he tells you the entire history and guess who the number one um, offender is that has created the entire offshore uh, tax haven system world over that hides, I think, $7 trillion in, in wealth from all over the world. It is not the Seychelles and it's not some Caribbean island. It is the United States of America. And he gives you the entire history of that. Wow. Awesome. awesome. <laughs> Rachel, uh, this is so exciting. I We should just play lightning round all night. I honestly, I was saying, can we just keep going? Uh, let's see. So coming up in, uh, in next week, next Tuesday, is uh, Shay Serrano's new book, uh, Hip Hop and Other Things. Um, Shay is a fantastic guy to work with. He does a lot of great stuff uh, in the sort of book community, especially for uh, Latinx readers, authors, writers, all kinds of great stuff. Um, I've worked on a couple of books with him now, and it's fantastic. Uh, and it's the same sort of model as the last book we did with him uh, called Movies and Other Things. So it's illustrated, tongue in cheek, uh, but also like really fantastic sort of oral history of hip hop artists and genres and just great, like great, great stuff. Um, and then it's not out yet and it won't be for a while, but uh, I did sign up a book recently that is essentially the first uh, authoritative biography of Ira Hayes, who was one of the Marines who raised the flag on Iwo Jima during World War II. Um, Ira Hayes, unfortunately, died in 1977, I want to say. Um, and his story, his life kind of got uh, subsumed by pop culture. Um, movies, Johnny Cash's song, which is a great song, but it's, you know, still sung by a white man. Um, and this is, uh, and it's written by a native professor and it is essentially sort of a reclamation of this native man's life, both before, during and after the war. Um, and I'm really, really proud to have acquired it and I'm really excited to publish it. Awesome, and I gotta be an agent guy and push my own clients here. So I have uh, Claude Andrew Clegg, who is a professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, he has a dual, um, uh, posting in um, African diaspora, as well as African American history. This is the first narrative look at the Obama administration, the black president, a hope and fury and the age of Obama, and um, a look at uh, the seeding of some of the things that happened after the Obama administration. And then um, the amazing Aggie Gond. Aggie Gond is probably the most, um, uh, prolific uh, no, uh, contemporary American art uh, philanthropist. She was for many years the president of MoMA and she created the studio and art um, uh, program in New York City schools, bringing art uh, classes into schools. Pardon me. <coughs> I worked with her daughter Kat on this. Uh, Aggie had a Roy Lichtenstein painting as one does and sold it for $165 million and gave all the money to create Art for Justice to um, tackle um, uh, incarceration, um, bail reform, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and helping people transition after prison into um, meaningful lives um, and, and, and help repair. Um, really, really amazing lady. This is a game based on her collection, which is all over Crystal Bridges, MoMA, it's uh, through Cleveland, it's through, uh, been gifted throughout uh, the United States. So that's all I got. And Melissa, I'll hand it back to you. 
Thank you very much. And yes. thank you for letting us go yes. over. No problem. Um, so if we can get like a, a virtual round of applause in the chat, um, spirit hands, spirit fingers, um, ASL, you know, applause, all of it. Thank yous in the chat. That would be really great. So we can see that you were with us and you were engaged and you enjoyed the event. Um, so thank you to the Center for Nonfiction and the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, our panelists, and of course, Kevin, for sharing their time and experiences with our students. I mean, dropping your emails in the chat and just obviously being open to, to building that bridge and, and building that connection, I think really speaks volumes to you all as professionals and, and we can't say thank you enough. I just wanna remind everyone that tonight's event is part of the Graduate Initiative for Inclusion and Engagement. This is only one of a series of events throughout the semester. To learn more on upcoming events, be sure to check out our events calendar, which has been included in the chat. I'd also like to extend a big thank you to everyone who attended and participated. We hope that you were able to gain a lot out of today's event.